you guys want to follow along on social, there's some stuff on stage. But how about a warm welcome for Peter Gorenstein from Cheddar, the Chief Content Officer, who's one of the board members of Cheddar. Can you explain, how many people here have heard of Cheddar before this? Looks like a little bit less than half. I'll take it. How many yeah. people do you normally find if you're at like, a social gathering have heard of Cheddar? It depends the age of the, of yeah. the crowd. Younger people know it. Yes. And we're old in here. Yeah, that's why only half of you know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Can you explain to those who don't what it is? Yeah, so we call ourselves a post-cable network company. So basically, we are like CNN or uh, MSNBC or Fox News, but rather than being on traditional cable providers, we are on uh, virtual MVPDs, which are uh, YouTube TV, Sling TV, um, Philo, all of these sk so-called skinny bundles out there that where you can get TV through your internet. And so what's maybe one of the biggest misconceptions about what Cheddar does and how it gets to consumers? Uh, I think, you know, we're lumped in with digital media, and I think people uh, at first are like, think it's just a website. I think that's the first issue. And because we're a distributed media company, like, uh, and we do different things. So somebody knows us from, like, our, fa our Facebook gadget videos, right? And they think that's all we do, or somebody knows us from the, the live network and they think that's all we do. So uh, we do all of those things. And so I think sometimes there's misunderstanding in the marketplace on exactly you know, what, what we are. What are, your top, what are your top few distribution mechanisms or, or channels? So uh, we're currently, I think we've run the table on all of the skinny bundles, so we're on every single one right now. Um, and obviously... Skinny bundle sounds like an industry term that I yeah. don't know. Okay, so that's the YouTube TVs of the world, the Slings, the Direct TV Nows, all of those internet TV providers. Uh, we're on every single one of those uh, available in the U.S. And then we are also available directly through an app. Uh, we are available through Samsung TV, uh, the, the TV Plus app as well. Um, <clears throat> and we also have a large social media presence. So we put out tons of videos on Facebook, Instagram, Snap. We have a Discover uh, channel. We're on YouTube. So all of those, you know, combined are depends on the month, but anywhere from 400 to 500 million video views a month. So what I was getting to is I'm curious what the distribution curve is. Is there any one channel that you know we got to get here first because... 30% of reviews happen there, and then the rest is long tail, or is it evenly distributed? Um, so the, the mo I guess the bet we took initially when we launched the company was that, you know, you're going to have these cord cutters, but you're also going to have cord nevers. Those are people that never get, you know, never get a cable subscription and just have Netflix or Amazon or, or whatnot. And so it was very important from day one to focus on all of these skinny bundles and get full distribution on those. There was a, a industry report that came out mm, two days ago, maybe, uh, from Moffat Nathanson, which is a big media, well, not boutique, but very respected media uh, uh, analyst or investment bank. And they said by 2023, there's going to be more than 30 million of these households, uh, 30 million households in the US that have one of these platforms. So that was the bet from the very beginning. And then when we launched, Facebook Live happened, and so we were like, oh, you know, we're doing live TV, which everyone said was a dumb idea, and Facebook Live happened there. So initially, that was a big push. Now, Facebook Live is basically dead, and we don't care about it at all, but um, that was an initially a huge platform for when, us. Just to clarify, when you say Facebook Live is dead, do you mean from a business perspective, or the, the usage in general has gone down dramatically? The, well... I think from a business perspective, they realized it wasn't as big as they thought it would be, and so like they've turned off the the pump. So uh, it, you know, it's just not a good viable traffic yeah. source. So why did you get involved with Cheddar to begin with? Um, because I had nothing better to do, <laughs> essentially. Uh, no, so I was at previously at Yahoo, and I was there for over six years, and that's a long time to be at any one company. 
uh, and I was just kind of on autopilot, and the the weight of the bureaucracy had had really worn me out. Um, and if anyone knows any history about Yahoo, it's like a shit show. So um, I was just really tired of doing that, and was looking for new opportunities, and was talking to some people, and uh, a friend said. A mutual friend introduced me to John Steinberg, our, our CEO, and said, hey, John has this idea. You guys should chat. I think it's really good, and you'll be you know, excited by it. So uh, I met with John, and we started chatting and had like a three-month conversation that led into uh, forming the company. Yeah. So how do you decide? First of all, how do you define your role as, as, as chief content officer? Um, Basically, anything that goes on air on the network or on our any video we produce is ultimately my responsibility. Um, that doesn't mean that I know of everything that we produce or watch the the networks nonstop because uh, I'm you know busy doing more boring things most of the time. Um, but that's yeah, that's my job. And so, how do you decide what makes the cut? Um, well, you know, the nice thing is, um, because a lot of these platforms, these, the, you know, the YouTube TVs of the world and all these other skinny bundles, the, the data is not public and you can't actually share it with other, uh, partners. It's really up to us. So it's not like, we're not like slaves to like, you know, we must grow traffic, you know, like if you have a traditional digital media company, it's all about driving more traffic and driving more traffic, and yeah, it's amazing. You're going to hit 500 million video views, and then guess what happens after you hit 500 million video views? You need to get to a billion. You need to get, and then you know what happens after that? It keeps going up. It keeps going up and up and up, and it's just, it's it's this hamster wheel that never ends, and so we've been fortunate enough at to this point to be able to program it however we think is best and smartest. So how would you describe then the voice of Chip? Yeah, so um, the initial idea is this. Uh, business news is dominated by CNBC, Bloomberg, and Fox Business News, and the average viewer of all of those is over 60 years old. And the thought was, well, it's not like you know, a flip, a, a switch flips in your head, and when you're 60, it's like, I care about business news now, right? I think people care about these things, care about their money throughout their life, but there was just no one there uh, providing good content to them. So all of these networks are obsessed with like the Fed or obsessed with, um, I don't know, old boring companies. And too often the conversation is really boring on there. So we decided we're going to focus on interesting things to us, which are startups, innovation, technology companies, media companies, IPOs, um, the things that people get excited and talk about. So. Um, we thought by doing that and being on these different platforms, we will attract a younger audience. And so far, that's been true. What's something that you guys have put on air that you thought this wasn't really authentic to Cheddar? Um, you know, sometimes you get a guest that may be the CEO of a company, and it's just kind of like a prestige thing, but it's not really core to what we do. But it's hard to say no. Meaning someone who's a, a name brand, you know, yeah, the CEO a of a brand, name brand company. Yeah, right. And to be honest, like I don't really care, but it, it looks good. it box. looks good, yeah. and it also helps you get other big guests when yeah. you book somebody that's important. Yeah. What, what's some of the content you're most proud of putting out? Um, I re re lately I really love our YouTube content. Um, we put a lot of emphasis behind YouTube over the last year. We started with zero subscribers. Now we have uh, almost 250,000 subscribers, and uh, these videos are getting you know average of hundreds of thousands of views per video. And I'm really proud of it because I think it's interesting stuff. It's unique, um, and also like Facebook or uh, Snap or all these social platforms. You know, metrics to a large extent is like total bullshit. It you know the three second view or whatever. That's not really engagement. But on YouTube. Engagement is true. There's no, you can't really game it. Um, people come, there's definitely like, they're seeking it out and then they're really engaged and the comments are, are real. So 
I'm sure there are lots of companies in here who would also want to have that kind of a, of a following on YouTube. How did you find that you got your first five, 10,000 subscribers? We hired a really good head of growth uh, and audience development. Uh, and that person did what? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> He's much smarter than I am. Um, so we did, I mean, we did, you know, it, it's, it's a hard formula um, because it involves a lot of different strategies. And we, one of the strategies that worked out well was we partnered with sort of like-minded um, publishers and producers on YouTube that we shared their videos on our channel and they um, did vice versa. And so that, that seemed to be a win-win and that's kind of got, it, got us started. And then on YouTube, it's just sort of the more content, the more consistent you are, the more consistent the voice, the, you know, the hamster wheel starts, the, 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 it's a better mousetrap. Do you share all the content to all the channels or do you choose selective content for selective Yeah, content? so we don't, but um, the nice thing about the YouTube content is then, so those are like six or seven minute longer form videos, so we take those and we will run them live on our network, our live, linear networks. Um, and then we will also, on the weekends, we don't produce any live video on the weekend, so I gotta figure out how to fill those hours. And so we'll take some of those franchises, we'll stack three or four of those videos together and make a half hour out of them. So it's a nice um, repurposing of, of the content. Also, we'll put it on our Snap channel, uh, We'll take Snap videos, we'll put it on Instagram, TV. I mean, on social, we, we repurpose quite a lot. We also will recut a lot of our live guests or the interesting live guests, because we do about 30 a day and they're not all good. Um, we will take the best of those and we'll turn those into text on, like short, you know, minute to three minute text on screen videos that we'll then put on uh, different social platforms. So how do you, um, how do you decide then um, like, where do you go live directly? Is the goal to make, do you, do you want to be the destination? Do you want to be ultimately the destination that people go to Cheddar or that they find you through all these other distribution networks or, or platforms, channels? Right. Um, I mean, 10 years out. Yeah, I think ultimately the value, the most viewer value comes from watching our live linear networks right now. Um, and we understand that, you know, that's like the ultimate dream is that when someone wakes up in the morning, they put on Cheddar and it's just on in the background. Like, I, I don't care if they're watching it intently, but if it's just like on in the background, they tune in when they want, they, you know, and, and it's just there and they know it's always there, that's, that's good enough for me. Why the name Cheddar? Uh, so Cheddar is slang for money. It's a slang term for money, so that's how. That's it. That's it. Did you? Did, did you? Did we went through like a hundred names before we picked that one, though. What was? What was your runner up? I, you know, I don't even remember. We, we, it was like a lot. Cash money? No, it was a lot, <laughs> and then cheddar hit, and we were like, okay, that's it. So I don't know. I don't remember the other ones on the. Did you have to buy coin? The domain? Maybe was one, but then that was a failed app. Um, so I don't. Know. Do you know how you guys got the domain? Uh, we bought it. Yeah, not to, not so crazy story. Just bought it. We just bought it for $50,000. Yeah, that's not so bad. Uh, what's something that you guys have proven right? In the beginning, I'm sure there were a lot of naysayers. What's something that you've, that you've grown into realizing has come true? You, you started alluding to this before, but I'm wondering if, if, it's, if it's that. Yeah, so live video was dead, right? It was all text on screen, which text on screen obviously is a big uh, thing that still exists all over the web and will for a long time, and we do some of it too. But everyone said, you know, the only thing live experience anybody wanted was uh, sports. And so I don't think that's true. And then the biggest, you know, people were like, well, where are you going to be distributed? What's going to happen? How is anyone going to get you? No one's going to, you know, you're not going to get on Comcast or whatever. And uh, the growth of these OTT platforms and that whole thesis happening is really, you know, sort of right place at the right time. You remind people what year you guys launched? Uh, we launched uh, in ja technically like January something of 2016. Uh, John and I walked into a WeWork on February 1st, 2016, and 
the first thing we did was say, hey, do you have a computer? I was like, yeah, I have a computer, but it's like the one I use at home. And so we went to the Apple store and bought computers. And, that was how we, <laughs> and then we went back to the office and we're like, okay, now we can start. <laughs> so, Good planning. Yeah. So just, just for those who... who may not and then have... the first 15 employees that we hired, I, I would go to the Apple store and like buy them their computer. And then I just finally started giving them my credit card and they, they would go and buy it themselves. Um, but now we have an IT department. How... Congratulations. Yeah, I know. It's a big deal. <laughs> how, how, um, how many viewers, for those who maybe not have, have read our announcements, or, or maybe I, I think our information may have even been dated, how many views do you guys see on a, on a monthly basis? So it changes monthly, but um, like I said, oh, it's, it's over 500 million uh, video views across platforms. And, um, and what you does know, Fox News get? Well, I, it's apples and oranges. I don't know what their social is, but our social engagement, if you compare... They're definitely like, the orange. Right. The, the, yes. That's a Trump joke. The, uh, <laughs> the, the crowd tangle information on Facebook is um, our engagement. We were looking at it today. Our engagement is <clears throat> uh, maybe 36 basis points or something per post where everybody else is like... 0.15 or something, and our views are, are higher, and engagement is is, is is much higher on those. Um, but they're Nielsen rated. We're not Nielsen rated, so I don't know why. Why is that a big deal? Nielsen? Yeah. Um, For selling well, so Yeah, so Nielsen is like the gold standard for, or the only standard for television ratings, right? And so on these skinny bundles, there is, Nielsen doesn't track it. Nielsen is like, I don't think they've done anything since 1965. It's like the same. It, it's a terrible company, and it's impossible to track these. So what happened was, very fortunate thing happened was CNBC decided a few years ago, hey, these Nielsen numbers are not accurate because we're in a lot of trading floors, and we're in a lot of places where it's, it, groups are watching and not individuals, so we're being undercounted. And so they started to use this survey-based system called Cogent. And one of our advertisers said, hey, if you're having trouble, like, why don't you just use what CNBC uses? And we said, yes, let's use what CNBC uses. That's a great idea. At least there'll be, you know, something that we can say this is legitimate and what our competitor uses. So um, on that, it, you know, it's all proven true that, like, 75% of our audience is under the age of 34. Uh, they're in cities. They're affluent. It's average... Yeah, household income is over $120,000. Like, it's all these things that brokerage firms and, um, you know, financial services companies love to see and that they have this inability to find elsewhere. So can you take the user from your perspective? Like, can you drive a richer engagement than, say, a, you know, a Fox News use that example? Can I don't do? know. You don't know? Like tracking them from to drive a conversion, right? Like dunking. Yeah, drive, yeah. I I don't know. Driving conversion is really hard. Uh, and it, we were talking to a client about this today, and John, the CEO, is a funny character, and he basically was like, "Conversion's bullshit. No one can ever track it truly. You know, it's different. Like we're not a a clothing brand that like can advertise on Instagram and you could see direct like D to C conversion." Um, it's hard in media, and it's not, and it's not really accurate. Even the best of yeah. them. So, for someone in here, uh, we've had we've had Gary Vaynerchuk up here, who often talks about every company's a media company. If you are not hustling <laughs> harder than you're hustling, you're not hustling. That's right. He's like he's he's hardcore. Yeah. He yells at everybody all the time. Yeah. Um, so he talks about a, a lot of things, but uh, at every business, no matter what you do, is a media business. And one, I'm curious if you agree with that, but two, if, if you do, how do you think someone should create content, and how do they find a voice that can resonate? Not necessarily to get to 500 million views, but to, is someone who creates okay. content that resonates? Every media, uh, every company should not be a media company, is not a media company, um, they should have a voice, they should have an opinion, but they shouldn't like, I don't, I don't think they should all be like creating content because most people don't care. Like, uh, you know, I may buy Levi's jeans, but like, I'm not looking for their content. So, um, 
Is that but, because your perception of what Levi's puts out doesn't resonate with you? And if they got it right, you might care? I don't know. Feel really strongly about that, I don't, huh? I don't know. I just feel like, uh, you know, over the everybody wants to be a publisher now. And, you wear Levi's jeans, by the way? Uh, no, but I was using that as an example. Um, uh, what was the question? Content, every brand is a content company. You're saying no. Yeah, I don't think be. so. Or, or they shouldn't be. Yeah, should not. Be. I mean, just do what you do well. Just focus on one thing. You don't have to be a publisher. You don't have, like, I don't know. I just there are some aspects of like if you are a consumer brand, there are some things you can do, but like don't make that the 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 thing. But as a as a way to constantly engage your customers and break through some of the noise, which of which there is a lot, why not create some content to try to be? Yeah, a just create a couple of ads and run them on Instagram incessantly. It seems to work for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, now I lost my train of thought, but. So I, I'm curious, if you, from your point of view, if there's an element of pride around the quality of your content, and that you're yes. sort of tired of hearing from people like, I went live here, I shot my grandma in her bathroom, like, you know, all this crap about content production. I'm, I wonder, from your point of view, you think, no, there's a, there's a, there's a professionalism to this that's yeah. being lost. <clears throat> Did you ever see the movie um, Exit Through the Gift Shop? I, yeah, yeah, uh, I have it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's... Great movie, right? And so there's a point where, like, the, I think it's Banksy. He said, you know, I used to tell people that uh, everybody should try art. Everybody should be an artist. And then this one guy does it, and it's, like, all this, you know, cheap thing. And he said, I, I don't think that anymore. Um, and that's kind of how I feel about content. Like, not, it's not for everyone. Um, but I'm super proud that we're on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. All the things we do, every, the kind of guests that we get, um, the stories that we tell, our original reporting that we do, uh, the reporting we do from DC on a daily basis, I'm proud of all that, but at the, but I'm equally, um, I get equally upset and disappointed too because we have a long way to go. Who do you think is putting out crappy content that needs to stop? Oh, no, I'm just saying like, you know, not everyone with their iPhone is, I know. is an artist. I trying to push on the spot here. Oh, like, uh, like, I don't know. know, like everybody on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> all of them. They all are. I don't care about your kids anymore. Um, what? After the... the no. <laughs> but and you Don't you have kids? I do. One but I, I, two. two. And uh, I love them dearly. Um, but, you are know... Are they going to grow up and be like, Daddy, how come you never posted a picture of us? Yeah. Did Maybe. you hate us? Well, I have a lot. Your Dunkin' Donuts Facebook. videos are amazing. <laughs> they <laughs> They're might, a sponsor of Cheddar, in case you don't watch Cheddar. They might have a complex. But I learned this week that I'm like, my parents were not pushing me uh, when I was a kid to be like academically whatever or sports-wise. Like, they never came to a sports game. They never cared. Of, I don't even know if they ever looked at my report card. Um, and after this latest college scandal, I feel like oh, I shouldn't have a complex about that anymore. <laughs> I, I should be pretty happy and fortunate about that. You've come to peace with this. Yeah, totally. This caring issue. Um, you have a 201 area code. Yes. What's your Jersey connection? Uh, I grew up in Tenafly, New Jersey. Anyone is... from Tenafly? All Anyone? right. Yeah. Tenafly Tigers. That's uh, not my, really... My real. parents couldn't find the high school. <laughs> <laughs> I think kidding. we have they a kid. I don't they know. They, they couldn't find the gym, though. I, I guarantee that. Um, so, what did your what did, when, when you first went to join Cheddar? Yeah. Even though I can appreciate, I think many people here can that Yahoo sucked and was was boring. There was some stability to that. Mm -hmm. And even though John has a very impressive resume, there's an enormous amount of risk, and especially in this industry, breaking through the noise is enormously difficult. What did your family think of your decision to join Cheddar? They loved it. They really did. Actually, I had total and full support from everybody in my family, uh, including my wife. And really, the only reason why I did it was because of my wife. Not only did she give me encouragement, but she, uh, at the time, was working in digital media and sales. And so she made a lot of money. And so I was like, eh, we'll still pay the bills if I fail at this. So um, that was good. That gave me like a, a proper safety net. And then also, I just felt like, Talking to John, um, I was going to learn a lot. I was going to, no matter what, this was going to be what I would learn that here at Cheddar would be more than I learned in my entire career combined. And so far, that's been true. And even if it failed, I would, you know, fail upward and find another opportunity because 
Um, I'd never done a startup or been an entrepreneur, and I feel like it's a really um, empathetic team. And like failing in that doesn't ruin your career. Yeah, let's talk about that a little. You, you mentioned on the phone the idea of failing forward. You said failing up. How do you, you know, how can you get comfortable with the idea of failure? And how well, at you this look point, at I don't want us to fail. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty. I'm pretty. Uh, we have 180 employees now, and so I'm pretty. I'm pretty set on this thing succeeding. Um, but day to day, but, I'm but sure. We, yes, well, oh, God. I, yes, I failed What all went the wrong time. today? Yeah, I mean, it's just constantly things, it's a lot to coordinate on a daily basis, and right? And so, oh, today we were talking about a story we were working on, and the lawyer's like, you can't do that story. You're going to get us sued. So, what was the story? Um, it was about, we were doing something about this um, I forgot her name, but this woman that ran this scam, she got arrested in New York City. She was running around town, cheating people out of money, um, and was just this liar. She was like all over the Post and Vanity Fair. Uh, Anna something, I forgot her name. Yeah, yeah. Was she a client? <laughs> really good public community speaker. <laughs> yeah, she must have been. Good with her pitch, because I think she, she, uh, <laughs> right, she's in jail right now, and her trial starting soon. But anyway, all we we put all this time and effort into this story, and there was all this animation, and and basically the lawyer's like, "There's no way you can run that right now." That was not nearly as exciting as I was hoping it was going to be. No, but I mean that's a daily failure. Um, that, but like things like that ha happen all the time. Well, let's talk and about then, that, right? You have in your mind the idea of filling however many minutes of airtime with that yeah. story. What do you do? I think there's a lot of lessons in managing teams and what you do. How do you go from, okay, that's killed, we gotta find a three or a five or a seven minute segment on the fly when things are live, what do you do? Yeah, well, that's just being a live news producer, which, uh, you know, everybody, basically everybody we have working on the live network comes from traditional live television. So these are professionals, I mean, you just find something else to go to. I mean, there's just, just as a producer, there's your plan A, B, C, D. Like, you just have have a lot of options to go to. You take stories that you ran before. You hopefully have anchors that are good at just, you know, bullshitting for a few minutes to, to fill time. Um, I don't know. There's just a lot that goes, that you have a lot of built into the process. You have a lot of backups. So do you spend a decent amount of time planning for? No. How many times have a guest not shown up? Um, it happens not like it happens every day, but not a minute before they're supposed to go on air. You you know with enough notice in your world. Generally. What's enough notice? If you have an hour notice, you're good. Yeah, you're what good. if you have five minutes notice? That's bad. And but usually you have the other guests already there, and so you just move them up, and then then that saves you time. And then so instead of having five minutes to figure it out, now you have fifteen minutes or whatever to figure it out. And within that time, you have good producers that, that fill in the blanks. What do you think the lessons are from, a, from managing a small team perspective for entrepreneurs, especially with small teams here, because you are live, in, in how to manage those kinds of stressful situations? Um, it's not life or death. Like, basically, is you know, you want it to be as good as possible, but, um, and you want, you know, you, you don't want anyone to be incompetent or negligent or lazy. But at the same time, like, you know, it's life and shit happens. And so you want to be as empathetic as possible in those circumstances, unless someone like it happened because somebody was just not doing their job. Yeah. But if everybody does their job, you know, it, what, you can't really get upset. Entrepreneurs get faced with lots of different opportunities of a direction that they can go with their business, especially in the early stage. And so I think the breakout successes often are heads down really focused on the one thing. But it's easy to get distracted, certainly when there's revenue attached to it. Yeah. And I say this because I'm really curious about your Strayer uh, partnership. It seems not obvious. It seems like a distraction. So I'm curious about, first, if you can tell people what it is and why you, that you decided to, to go down that route and, and if it was a good idea. Uh, and we'll so send we the have, video right so to Strayer after this. <laughs> <laughs> I love Strayer. There are, loyal client of ours, and they were basically our first client, and so without them, uh, that first six months would have been really rough. Um, so that's really, John had a relationship with Strayer starting, and so it, this, it's this digital uh, MBA program focused on, on media. 
Um, and why are we doing it? Um, because they've been a loyal uh, advertiser yeah. from the very beginning, and it was a small relationship, and then it grew and grew, and, and actually um, the numbers on it grew, and, and they also have a program with Jack Welsh, and I think we outperformed that. Um, and so, yeah, it's a different business. I mean, we bought Rate My Professor, and we bought MTVU. Those aren't exact uh, fits either, but we thought... It, it fit our, our core demographic, and so that's why we did it. Um, but sometimes you do things like, in the beginning, we said yes to everything, right? The first year and a half or two years, we probably said yes to everything. And now we're starting to ask ourselves uh, why and say no and also cut things that didn't, you know, that were a lot of effort and didn't necessarily make sense and that we could focus our, our energy elsewhere. Yeah. Um, I asked you before, what's something that you guys have proven right? What's something that you've been that's, you've, you've been wrong about? Well, hiring, like you, you're wrong a lot in not a lot, but you are wrong enough in hiring where that's always a concern um, and always a rough mistake when it happens. Um, so that's something we think about. A lot, especially at a startup where every hire counts so much. Um, and when you make a bad choice and then you have to reverse that and then that, you know, it's it's really like four steps back, um, that, that really hurts. And so uh, hiring, being good at hiring is, is, is something we really focus on because we've been, you know, no, no one's 100%. Are there any go-to questions you have, especially in your industry, that you found to be effective in finding the right fit? Uh, I just try to drill down and make sure like, I get a clear sense of what this person does on a very uh, granular basis, right? Because it's easy to like BS your way through an interview and know all the things, but, but I know enough about producing content where I can tell if someone's like taking credit for something that they're not qualified to do. Uh, or understand like, oh, I can't do this, but they have the skills to take that next step to do it. Yeah. Do you look for people who are creating content as a hobby to bring into the business or people who are doing it professionally? I mean, obviously for different roles, but on the... We've hired people from all different backgrounds. Like one of our producers, uh, he was a broker for Wells Fargo. Uh, He was like 24 and he's like, I hate this. I love the markets, but I hate this job and I want to be a producer. And we took a shot on him, and he's two years later, he's still here, and he's doing a great job. We also hired uh, one of our anchors, uh, Nora Ali. She worked on Wall Street, worked at Goldman, um, left Goldman, worked at Jet, which is, was based here, or still, is based here. Right down the right? street. Yeah. Uh, and then she realized she was a product manager there and realized she wanted to be on camera. And she took some courses and we interviewed people from all over the country and all these affiliates around uh, around the country. And we liked her best. So with and she had basically zero experience. Yeah. Um, are there are there any you know looking back at those those hires? Are there certain traits that come to mind that you think have been critical? Yeah, like a passion for where a passion for the the subject matter, um, a curiosity for just you know life and learning, the, that's huge. Yeah, you you guys are a a um, media partner for Propelify, which we hugely appreciate. I know how expensive it is to send a whole crew out here to cover that event. How do you decide when it's worth doing something like that? Yeah, we go through. Um, a calendar of, you know, like, it, you know, it's a largely an editorial thing. So it's who's there, what good interviews can we get that we can't get on a normal basis? Um, will there be news made there? Uh, how expensive is it? Uh, we've covered Can a couple of times, Can's Lines, which is a big advertising thing. We did that the last two years, and this year we're not going to do it because we've done it. We kind of got what we wanted out of it, and it's really expensive to, to get there and stay there. Yeah. How much of, uh, is finding an exclusive story or having a unique view on a topic important? It's huge. So we, we, for our first two years, we had really zero original reporting. 
uh, and we start to build out that team. We have five people now uh, on our scoop team, we call it. So that's all original news. Um, uh, and so that's really big. And our DC reporter, more and more, is not just, you know, tracking the, the daily craziness, but he's also uh, really focused on getting exclusive interviews uh, fr from lawmakers to talk on things. So that really moves the needle. I, I think it was actually right around the time of our event that you guys were issued uh, press credentials to the White House, which I would think is a, is a very, very big deal. Yeah, huge. How, how does that happen, and, 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 and what was it a big deal? Yeah, it was huge. Uh, we, I mean, it, it was huge, but also, like, there's a lot of weird uh, outlets that have White House access. So uh, <laughs> it's, you know, there's, like, I don't know. Um, just odd, any media company really has access, which is a great thing about America, that you can get access no matter who you are. But getting daily press credentials was hard. Um, and we just reached out. And we were like, OK, we're big enough. We want to do this. If Trump's in the White House, this was right when he won the election. Like, economics and business are going to be huge topics. Um, and so we, gotta, we have to be there. And so uh, we kind of just put all our resources behind it and pushed and used any connection we had to, to talk to people there and, and find out how it worked. And, and we just hustled. Yeah. What's been if your... you're not hustling. <laughs> and buy my wine. <laughs> What's been your most um, viewed piece of content and where? Oh, our most viewed piece of content was I think 100 million views on this one video on a uh, laundry machine that folds your clothes. Yeah. Yeah, and that was like right before Facebook changed the algorithm. Um, and you know, they change the algorithm all the time and you never know. Um, oh, that was the other thing that we did really well in the beginning was we didn't bet on, you know, build the whole platform on Facebook. Yeah. Like, it, you know, everybody at the time, it was very in vogue to, like, Facebook's going to drive all your traffic. Just do what the platform wants you to do, and you're going to be great. And um, we kind of wanted to control our own destiny. And so it, that's been proven out for us because there's been a few media companies that did that and, unfortunately, you know, didn't last. Yeah. So I want to open up to some questions in the room. Anybody have any questions or I'll keep going? Not – this has been a quiet room tonight. Yes. Our editor-in-chief is probably our oldest employee, and he is, I, I actually don't know how old he is. Uh, I want to say he's over 60. I Do never you asked get a him. lot of resumes from people who may seem older, whether you know it or not? Um, I don't know the right way to ask that question. I don't know. I don't know, because we have a recruiter that thank God, screens the people now. So I, I only see them at the, the end stages. I guess a, maybe a better question is, do you find that what you do resonates with the old school media people who, and they want in? No. Is it the opposite? They think it's... I don't know. It's a toy? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I really... Do you work I, at Cheddar? No, I work at Cheddar, and that's all I do. The point is that's all I do, and so I'm not out talking yeah, yeah, to people yeah. about it. That's really the thing. Like, that's all I do. Uh, so I'm, like, very insulated and in this bubble, and so, like, I, I really don't know what people outside are saying about it. That, that's the that's truth. Um, but we do get a lot of people from Fox lately, uh, young people, young producers from Fox lately, who I think are, like, you know, not into working there anymore. How do you, si how do you decide about the editorial voice. I mean, we're, yeah, we want to say non... In particular. So one of the things that we wanted to do, like counter-program, you know, and focus on tech and media rather than, like, the Fed, right, on business, on, on just general news, we want to be nonpartisan. We want to be pretty much down the middle because you can get plenty anti-Trump, you can get plenty pro-Trump, but it's also nice to just get the news, right? Our D.C. coverage is just one aspect of the news. It's not this... 80, 90% of our coverage is not focused on politics. We're focused on tons of different headlines. And when you turn on, especially our, our news network, 
because we have two, we have Cheddar Business and Cheddar News, and Cheddar News is a headline news network, and it really does cover all of the news, which is, I think, something that's missing. You can't turn on the TV and actually get the news. What you get is, like, the latest Trump controversy and people fighting about it. Yeah. Well, typically that's because that's what drives engagement and gets people emotionally engaged. So have you right. been able to drive... And enrages them. Right, but they watch more, right? Yeah. Which is why I think the networks have gone in that direction. It's hard to be a moderate and, and for it to be interesting and entertaining. So how do you hold that line and still get viewership? Well, I guess... Um, we don't have to. So the average uh, per minute audience on CNBC in the demo, the younger demo, is like 30,000 people, right? So we don't, the, the point is, we didn't have to chase Facebook traffic and have a billion views to succeed, and we don't have to have a huge audience to succeed either. If we can find 30,000 viewers in that same age group, um, which is not an insurmountable task, we, yeah. we've done it. Yeah. There's a question in the back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was curious if Cheddar has any, has ever had any interest as they grow in you know, also branching out to the narrative content? Because I think that would be an interesting direction, or is there any way to fold that in, or is that just... What do you mean by narrative content? Well, more fictional, not news. Oh. Um, no, not at this point. We're pretty news-focused. Yeah. We, we actually, uh, though, we started licensing... Uh, so primetime has, like, we were always focused on daytime, and only recently we focused on primetime. And uh, with our other acquisitions, we also uh, uh, got the syndication rights to Nathan for you. Um, so we may be, you could watch that, 8.30, 9 p.m. every night, and also again at 11. Uh, <laughs> and um, so we may do some more of that kind of primetime program, but it, it it's all been, like, you know, his thing is like a, a business spoof thing, but it'd all be sort of ancillary to, to news. Do you get pitched show ideas? Yeah, we do. And do you take some of them? Uh, no, because we don't have enough money. That's an easy one. Yeah, they're really expensive to buy those shows. Jasmine, you had a question. Yeah, it was, um, so our first setup was all on the floor of the exchange, um, which, and, and our space on the floor is like really tiny. I want to say it's like from the, the, the anchor desk is like here, and then we're to the end of that stage. That's the whole thing. And we had our control room, we had a, our director, our switcher, our audio board, our cameraman, everybody in this little space to start, um, which was a totally insane thing to do. And then we realized um, as we expanded hours that, okay, we need to like get a fiber line and build a control room. And uh, luckily, we just have amazing people that, that we just put things together. Our first control room was uh, we opened a door in our office, and there was this giant storage closet. And we said, all right, we're going to build a control room here. And it was just like, it was just slowly one thing after another. Um, but that's been our biggest investment, though we've done it pretty cheaply. Like, Three million dollars to do three control rooms, the fiber, um, our set at the exchange we updated, and so that was maybe fifty thousand dollars. But uh, we've been able to do it like pretty cheaply with really smart young people that came from traditional media companies that weren't given a chance. Like our head engineer, our co-head engineer, was working audio at CNBC and had all these ideas and was just kind of stymied there, and so. Uh, when we hired him, he's like, oh, we could do this and this and this. And and then he, he and the other guy who we hired before he even graduated college uh, are just like wizards. And I, I don't know how they do it, but we give them a budget and somehow they figure it out. What's the turnaround time? So like, it's lucky, just I, lucky. I mean, I was super impressed having been on the show a couple of times, how quickly you guys, have, you know, you'll say, can you send me some stuff in the morning? I might be on two hours later. You've turned it into some very, very highly produced B-roll. Mm -hmm. What is the normal turnaround time with how you, you know, how quickly you can get things done and, and out the door? Um, yeah, any, I mean, it, in a breaking news situation, you have to do it really quickly, but, you know, a few hours. We have really good producers that work hard, um, and then there is a certain advantage to being live because it just sort of, like... Has to happen. It has to happen. You do the prep, but it happens, and that's it. Once you get into, in like, an edit room and you start cutting things, like... 
I, I don't know what happens, but you just you just lose time. Just things, everything gets complicated, everything gets slowed down, and so we're able, like our YouTube content, those writers and producers are doing the whole thing, but that whole process from pitch to writing to producing it takes three weeks for one seven minute video, right? We produce 18 hours of live content a day. Yeah. So it's just, there's something about being live that just Forces allows you to churn, yeah. Over in the corner here. Yes, yeah, so we focus on, I mean, primarily public companies, so we're just following, you know, media and technology stocks, um, but then we're reading, you know, producers and bookers just read a lot of stuff. We're at the point now where we get a lot of inbound and we get that, you know, the PR company will reach out to us or the founder will reach out to us, and then we just do some research and vet it and see is this legit or not or is this of interest, is it visual? Is it um, is it different? Is it new? And you know, just kind of editorial judgment. And in that vein, I actually think the re the way our media partnership started was a cold outreach. Eventually, someone connected to higher ups, but it, it started with a cold outreach. With here's what we're doing. Do you think it's interesting? And to your credit, you guys wrote back, and, and something blossomed from there. So definitely reach out. Do, do you do you go through every one of those, or as many as you as you can? Not maybe you personally, but do they all get looked at? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that's the booking job, the booking team. That's you know, that's part of their job. Yeah, for sure. There was a yeah in the back. Are you able to divulge uh, what you make as a carriage fee for a network on say a thirty nine ninety nine Sling TV plan? And zero, zero point zero zero. Approx we we make no carriage fee. Uh, we get nothing, and that's why we're enticing to these companies, to these uh, MVPDs. Nothing. Well, to be clear, though, aren't you growing viewership that you then go resell in yeah, the so what to we do, So what we do is uh, we get a rev share of the ad inventory that runs in between, you know, in the commercial breaks. And we also, our, our big model is branded content. So we do uh, branded content live in our shows. We display, we have full, you know, disclosure. This is an ad. Uh, and we pocket 100% of that. The more distribution we have, the more we can charge, um, the better our content. You know, it starts with if our content is good, then the the distribution platforms want our content, and then if that's good, advertisers are interested because we have it. You know, it's this virtuous cycle, and that's all we focus on. Those three pillars are, are what we focus on. Last question, right here. Um, but when we started, we were hopeful that we would, and then we quickly realized. No, no one's going to give us money, but it's more important to get the carriage. With uh, your growth into news, uh, I know it's not exactly analogous, but ha have you learned anything from BuzzFeed's experience of trying to grow into like legitimate news? Um, you know, because they've like kind of struggled, even though they hired uh, like uh, several Pulitzer Prize winners on their team. Well, I mean, we we've, we've always focused on news, so it's not. It, it, you know, we weren't doing like listicles and then went into news. Um, that said, like their news department is is fantastic. They have great reporters. They they do well. Um, I think with them, what happened was I think the news is doing fine. It's just like they grew a lot. Their revenue growth did not catch up with uh, you know the size of the team, and we have always focused on keeping the team small and building this company. Uh, for the long haul, and have, have kept our our costs as low as possible. And in fact, you said a, an early focus, maybe a founding focus around profitability, which is unusual, right? Yeah. So yes, I mean, we so our John, our our CEO came from Buzzfeed. Our COO also came from Buzzfeed, right? And they were there in like really good times, and they understand that like they were they were the guys there that are like. You know, maybe we shouldn't expand so fast, or maybe you know, like like what's the economic model here of how is that going to work? And so they're really pragmatic, and <coughs> um, you know, you have to make a case for 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 every hire. And I think 
a lot of these, like, it's not that digital media is not successful. It's hugely successful, right? Uh, you know, it reaches a really large audience. These companies are making hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. It's not, it's not a fluke. This is a real thing. That said, you're 10 years in on your investment, and those VCs want an IPO or they want an acquisition. You know, they, they want an exit. And so um, now they're at a point where it's like, okay, we've reached kind of scale. It's not going to grow as fast. What are we going to do to make this... A, a, a shiny new thing again. How much money have you guys raised? Uh, I think like over fifty million dollars, and thirty-five we have in the bank. Do you you know often the the main executive focus and certainly the CEO focus is around fundraising? Is that John's main focus? No, not at this point. We hope to never raise a dime again. Yeah. What's a, I want you to end with making a prediction on where you think this industry is headed. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'd say I'd put you on the spot, but we kind yeah. of went over this before. <laughs> Did we? <laughs> we can skip that question if you want. Will, will Amazon... Well, okay, so I think the prediction is, what I said earlier, is that everyone's going to have these, you know, Cable is going to, traditional cable is going to go away and it will be replaced by these virtual MVPDs. Let me ask you a different bundles. question. That is a good answer. I don't mean to cut you off. What companies in your space won't exist in 10 years? Um, well, they all seem to be acquiring one another. So, like, all these big media companies won't, it, like, Fox isn't. You know, Fox is going away very soon on March 20th. Um, so I don't know. There may be a consolidation of these very, very, very large media companies, uh, and we'll see fewer and fewer in the future. Not not because they'll go out of business, but just just the acquisition. Yeah, yeah, consolidation will continue to happen. Um, this is the real last question. This is a community that we try to focus a culture around helping each other, and so I want to know what we can do to help you. Um, okay, if you have an interesting company or um, you know of an interesting entrepreneur, you can send it our way, booking at cheddar.com. I guess that wasn't the real last question. Did any of the This is the third <laughs> not real last, last question. question. I, I, had I, one I told or two you more. I had two kids. I would like to see them at some point. Um, w w did any of the startups that you saw tonight qualify to get on the show? Yes. Which one? Actually, yeah, which yeah. one? Really? Yeah, really. That's, I feel like that's not nice. Part, it's not, but it's the reality of how startups work. Somebody's going to be disappointed in life. That's kind of how it goes. I thought the last product was most uh, kind of scalable and, and at the stage that would be of, uh, once they launch, would be of, of interest to us. Cool. Um, how about a big round of applause for Peter? Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Are you going to hang out for a few minutes? Okay, we're going to be done in like three minutes. Okay, great. Yeah.